Hachette Audio presents Winter Street Written by Ellen Hildebrand Read by Aaron Bennett Dedication For Judith and Duane Thurman who have kept my paper angel ornament, as well as all of my other childhood memories, cherished and safe these many years. Hugs and love. December 23rd. Kelly. He thinks nothing of walking into room 10 without knocking. The door is unlocked. And George hasn't checked in yet anyway. George is due on the 1130 ferry with his 1931 Model A fire engine, a bespoke Santa Claus vehicle. But he was delayed because of snow in the western part of the state. George has gamely brought the fire engine over and donned the red suit every December for the past 12 years. George weighs in at 305 pounds, give or take the five, and is the jolly owner of a full head of white hair and a white goatee, new since his divorce. Before, it was a full beard. Kelly wants George to arrive so that Mitzi will relax. According to Mitzi, no one can possibly replace George, and nothing ruins Christmas like an absent Santa. When Kelly swings open the door to room 10, he realizes he's intruding. There were two people in the room, kissing. Kelly's first instinct, the instinct of everyone he knows when walking in on something private, is to blurt out, sorry, and slam the door shut. He has a quick, unfortunate vision of his Aunt Sissy on the toilet during his grandfather's wake. But what he just caught the shortest glimpse of, the length of one frame of film, was nothing like his Aunt Sissy on the john. It was two people in full, passionate lip-locking. Necking, they used to call it in high school. The click of the door instantly reveals the identity of those people. It's George, their Santa Claus, and Mitzi, Kelly's wife. Kelly flings the door back open, fast enough that George and Mitzi have yet to fully disengage. George still has his hands on Mitzi's hips and Mitzi's hands are buried in George's white hair. What? Kelly says. He's not sure what to think. He has been in crisis for weeks. First of all, it's December, a month he used to own on Nantucket. He had a full in through Thanksgiving and Christmas stroll, but he hasn't had a paying guest since the 10th of December. Normally, he has a waiting list during the week of Christmas, just like the original Christmas, no room at the inn. The Drell witches and the Kasperzaks used to come to see their grandchildren. The Elmers came to escape their grandchildren, and the other four rooms were taken by young couples who found Nantucket a charming place to spend the holiday. And then, of course, there was always George. But this year, nobody. This year, the neon sign in Kelly's mind flashes, Vacancy, vacancy. It's his least favorite word in the English language, especially since his finances are in such precarious shape. Kelly has kept the inn up and running for 19 years by supplementing the inn's budget with the treasure trove of savings he had when he left his real job, trading petroleum futures in New York. That treasure trove has now dwindled to an amount in the high four figures. Lately, Kelly has fantasized about selling the inn off as a private home. It would fetch between four and five million, he guesses, and moving to Hawaii. His ex-wife, Margaret, is flying to Maui on Christmas Eve, as soon as she finishes anchoring the CBS Evening News. When she told Kelly this a few weeks ago, he felt a Category 5 pang of jealousy. He thought, please take me with you. But the deeper reason Kelly has been addled is because his youngest son, Bart, who had been stationed in Vilsack, Germany for two months, where it was all pretzels and blondes, 
was deployed to Sanjin, Afghanistan, on December 19th. He sent Kelly and Mitzi a text that said, Made it in country. Love you. And that was the last they heard. The texts that Kelly and Mitzi tried to send back were undeliverable. Kelly's emails go through, but they remain unanswered. Kelly imagines his words whipping across sandy, inhospitable terrain.